Hello, everyone, and welcome to our virtual animal meet and greet. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Rachel, and I work with the education team at the Natural History Museum. As you can probably tell, I'm not at the museum right now. I'm at home like many of you, but we do have some amazing staff that still need to go into the museum to help take care of all the living animals that call the museum home. Some people are surprised to learn that the museum even has live animals, but we do have over 100 different species of living animals that are in places like our nature lab, the new Bugtopia exhibit in the Discovery Center, and some that live behind the scenes. So I'm joined today by our live animal program team, and along with our animal ambassadors, they're here to help connect your hearts and minds to the science that happens at NHM. Leslie Gordon, who you'll be hearing from in a moment, is our manager of vertebrate living collections at the museum and she has a few special friends to share with you today. Leslie's at the museum, but she's not wearing a mask because she's alone in a locked room right now with her animals, of course. We'll also have some helpers from our education department, Becca and Jessica, who will be assisting behind the scenes. Thanks, team. We'll be together for about 30 minutes and get to meet some of our amazing animals. And after Leslie's done sharing, we're going to answer some of your questions about the animals we've seen. Now, this might be a bit of a different format of Zoom than some of our students joining today are used to. You won't see any of your classmates or your teacher or any of the other students watching this program today, and we can't see or hear you. You'll only be able to see and hear us. So since we can't actually see one another, I do want to take a moment to make a special shout out to all the students joining us from today's schools. Thanks so much for being here. Okay, so since we can't see any of you and you can only see us right now, we're going to use the chat function to ask questions. During the presentation, our friends watching on Zoom can click on the chat box to type in a question that we'll try to answer at the end of the presentation. Your chat box might look a little different depending on what device you're on right now. If you're on a tablet like an iPad, your chat button will be in the upper right-hand corner. And if you're on a laptop, a Chromebook, or on your phone, the chat button will be on the bottom in the middle. Type your question directly into the chat for us to see it, and your question will only be seen by the museum staff for running the Zoom right now. The chat box is currently closed. We ask that all of our friends joining us today only put questions or comments related to the presentation in the chat. This helps us make sure we can get through as many questions as possible. And to respect our panelists and our staff assisting with this program, we also ask that we all use appropriate language in the chat. Folks not following our code of conduct may be asked to leave today's program. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can, but in case we don't get to answer your question today, I encourage you to record your ideas and you can learn about more about the animals we're seeing today on your own. As you might be able to tell with our slimy slide backgrounds, we're going to be exploring the science of slime during our presentation today in partnership with Nickelodeon. So today and next week on Thursday, you can join us to meet some of our live animals and learn specifically about the clever ways that some of them use their slime to survive. So if you'd like, grab a piece of paper and a pencil so you can record your experience while you're watching today. You can note down any of those questions you have, maybe a few facts you've learned, or draw or write a description of what the animals look like. So let's get started. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn off my screen share and switch our camera over to Leslie so you can meet our live animals and you'll see me again in a little bit. All right. Hey, Leslie. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be with you today. All right, now, when you think about the words slimy and scaly. What comes to mind? Unfortunately, some people think, ew, yuck, and I think it's too bad because I personally think the slimy and scaly animals, in particular today I'm talking about the reptiles and amphibians, I think they're tiny little superheroes. Did you ever wish that you could like climb up a wall by yourself? Did you ever uh, wish that maybe you didn't have to carry so much water with you when you go out on a hike? These are just a couple of things that these tiny little superheroes can do with their slime and their scales. So we're gonna meet the slime lovers first. I've got three gorgeous native amphibians here with me today. I've got a California newt over here. I believe this is Walter. I've got three Pacific tree frogs in here. They have funny names. Gooseberry, kumquat, and ziggy starfruit. <laughs> and I've got T-bone, the western toad. So these gorgeous animals are amphibians. And as you know, amphibians start out life in the water. They need water to survive. They need to be around as much water as they can. So when they start out their life, I'm gonna show you a picture of what it looks like. When they're in the water, they are these gorgeous yolks. 
and they are floating suspended in this jelly, crystalline jelly, gooey stuff. It's like space capsule that keeps them moving, keeps them floating, keeps them protected and oxygenated and safe so that they can eventually emerge into tadpoles, also known as larva, and go on about their little tiny lives as froglets, toadlets, or newtlets, which I don't think is a word. I just think it sounds cute. <laughs> and so next picture is gonna be some Southern California habitat where you could find happy amphibians living there. Doesn't it look beautiful? The problem is there are times when that water dries up or when the weather gets really inhospitable to amphibians who need to be moist. They can't go sit out spread eagle in the sun like it here is popular because they'll dry out. They breathe and drink through their skin. So they have to have moisture. So those times when the water dries up or they have to travel away for safety, they've got a couple of tricks up their teeny tiny froggy sleeves to keep them safe. For starters, they have slime. <laughs> so amphibians have skin, okay, just like you and I do. But on our skin, we have some slightly different things. We have keratin, okay, in the form of hair. And we'll talk about that with the reptiles. But in particular, we also have glands that help us sweat when we get overheated. The amphibians, they don't have sweat glands, they have mucus glands. The mucus is the slime that coats around them and keeps them moist. It's very important too, because moist skin helps you breathe and drink through their skin. What, Leslie, what are you talking about? Drink through their skin? Can you do this? Can you put your finger in a glass of water get totally refreshed and go on about your day fully hydrated? No, you cannot. Try it at home, though. It won't, it won't work. <laughs> Amphibians can do this. This is amazing. They drink through their skin. And in particular, two of them that I brought today have what's called a seat patch, which is an adorable name, I think. The thighs of the frog on the left look extra bumpy, right? And the tummy of the toad on the right looks extra bumpy as well. That's the seat patch. That's extra permeable, extra thin skin that helps them absorb water through their tush. <laughs> That's right. They can drink through their hinder. And how is that helpful? Well, like I said, sometimes it dries up. I'm gonna show you this in action. The next photo is one of my favorite photos I've ever taken. This is tiny, teeny, tiny little froglets and toadlets hunkering down inside of a coyote footprint. Those lucky froglets had a coyote run by that morning, left some muddy little soft spots in the caked up soil so they could run over, hunker down, and drink up all that moisture through their tush. Isn't that incredible? I mean, nature is connected, you guys. That coyote doesn't even know that he saved lives, I'm sure. <laughs> so it's a really important thing to have this seat patch. Now they also have to be smart. They have to you know, have the right behavior to keep themselves moist. The next picture is some body language that amphibians will show. On the left, you see two frogs that are kind of curled up, their feet are curled under them. They're letting the slime do the work, but they're also trying to prevent evaporation by curling up, tucking in their feet, protecting that seat patch. And the newt, the uh, ridiculously adorable newt on the right, <laughs> has gone up away from the creek, found a muddy hole to hide out during the dry season. But now it looks like he is ready to come on out, go down to party in the pool, <laughs> because now it's the moist season, I'm assuming, in that photo. Is that adorable or what? Now they have one more way that they can use sort of a slimy substance to protect themselves. And that is, the next photo is, these guys have a toxin in their skin. The newts in particular have a tetrodotoxin, it's a hard one to say, tetrodotoxin. And that toxin makes any larger predators who eat them regret it because they will get a tummy ache or worse. Doesn't really much bother humans, just don't eat them, okay? Promise, don't eat them. <laughs> And the toads as well, they have a little bit of bufotoxin. It looks like a pimple kind of behind their eye there. That's a bufotoxin. Same thing, same purpose. It kind of makes anyone regret nibbling on them. All right, so there's another gorgeous Southern California habitat I'm gonna show you. 
and it's a little bit drier of a habitat, not super hospitable for the amphibians, unless there's a creek nearby. That habitat is perfect for the reptiles. I have got a gorgeous reptile here with me today, Juniper, the Southern Pacific rattlesnake. Oh, can't quite see him, can you? I'm sorry, guys, I'm gonna adjust camera. I hope that's not too wobbly for you because I want you to be able to see him. There he is. Hi, Juniper. <laughs> so uh, what was I saying? So reptiles, they have their own super shields. They don't have a spine. They have scales. Their scales act like those super shields to keep in that moisture for them. They can go farther away from water than amphibians can. You know, a lot of people think reptiles are slimy, but they're not, and they can't be. They need to be farther away from the water sometimes. So they got to really lock it in like saran wrap. And that's what these scales in the you know, keratin, remember I said you have keratin, hair, nails, that's keratin. They have keratin on their skin too, and it's those scales. So what dynamite things can scales do? Well, it helps them to walk for one without having any legs. And I think it's beautiful the way they do it. Watch rabbit's belly here as we play a little video of him walking. This is Rabbit the boa constrictor. Isn't that gorgeous? The way he undulates on the floor. You can see his belly undulating along. I think it's really gorgeous. Now they use the scales on their belly to do this. They have thick scales, extra thick scales that are a little bit different than the ones on the back. They can not just walk with their scales, they can climb with those scales. So see the photo on the right? That's the belly scales. And on the left is showing you what they can do. You got a snake climbing a cactus. We've got a snake climbing a tree. It blows my mind that a little creature with no legs can go straight up a cactus all by himself. I've been doing this for 21 years. That still blows my mind to imagine doing that. It's really cool. So they protect them from those spines. They protect them from rocks, right? There's another really cool thing that scales can do. If you're lucky enough, like the rattlesnakes are, your scales might be keeled. They have these little tents on them, which helps funnel water down to your mouth. That's very handy in a place where it dries out sometimes. Watch this rattlesnake. This isn't a wild one, but you can see his little head pulsing as he drinks the water that collects and trickles down his scales. Isn't that really cute? I think it's adorable. <laughs> so if you're lucky enough to have those kind of scales, you can drink from them as well. Now let's talk about shedding. Reptiles and amphibians both shed their skin. As a matter of fact, you do too. Did you know you shed your skin? Let's do this together. I want you to put out your hand, okay? And go like this, one, two, three, shit. <laughs> every time you itch, every time you scratch, you're shedding skin, did you know that? We actually shed our entire top layer of skin about once a month, which is about as much as reptiles do. Now we shed for the same reasons too. Our skin wears out. They don't bust out of their skin like an insect's exoskeleton. They shed, for the same reason as us, the skin wears out. If you don't believe me, run your finger on top of the bookshelf or the television, what's gonna be up there? If it's like my house, it's gonna be dust. <laughs> and you know what dust mostly is? You and your family's skin. Most of it is skin. I know that's kind of gross to think about, but really, you know, reptiles and amphibians who shed in one whole piece, it kind of makes them seem extra tidy and clean, doesn't it? <laughs> would you like that? Like amphibians in particular often do this in the water. If you took a bath, would you like to see like your skin floating away from you in the bathtub? <laughs> no, are you sure? Anybody? <laughs> well, it's less dusting if you think about it that way. Here's a newt who just shed his skin and you can see a little copy of himself just kind of floating in the water <laughs> next to him. I know it seems a little strange to people that that happens. Now the reptiles shed their skin too. This is a perfect little copy of a snake. You can see the scales on his back are small. 
And here's those belly scales that I was telling you about. See that? Now, another cool thing, you can see the eye caps. What are eye caps? Let's see if I can get it just right for you to see. Snakes don't have eyelids. You'll always lose a staring contest with a snake. <laughs> they don't have eyelids. They have these protective scales over their eyes called spectacles or eye caps, and they shed them too. It also gives you a bit of a window into the shedding process. Can you see how the eyes are whitish on those snakes? What you're seeing is the next layer down. You know, the top layer wants to shed, top layer of skin. The next layer of skin down melts like butter to get that top layer off. And you're seeing that melted skin in the eye caps. <laughs> Isn't that strange and cool? And in the picture on the top right, hopefully you can see too, uh, there's a couple of geckos there. And when the skin starts to separate, it turns a whitish milky color too. So that's a really cool thing to be able to see this process happening. Now, speaking of sheds, I have one last cool thing to show you about modified scales. Like I said, this is Juniper the rattlesnakes. Oh, hi, he's moving around. This is his shed skin. But look at the tail. There's no tail there. Why? That's because every time a rattlesnake sheds, they add a segment to the rattle. A segment is a little part of the rattle. You can even hear it a little bit here. This is really a cool process and it's their own modified alarm system. Scales can be an alarm system too. Now I put together a little video for you about how this works because a lot of people ask me, oh, how, how does it rattle? Does he have something inside of there? Let's watch real quick. What the snake is saying here is, I'm scared. Please leave me alone. But how does he make that sound? A look inside of a rattle shows loops of keratin hooked together. Every time he sheds, he gets a new segment. But not at the end like you might think. The new segment forms at the base of the rattle and pushes the old ones outward, making it even longer. Watch as our own sweet juniper sheds his skin and at the base of the rattle, you can see that it's pink. That is the new segment. Is that gorgeous or what? I mean, come on, that is so cool. Wouldn't you like that to have your own little alarm system? So here's that rattle again. Now you can see, it's just the sound of the segments rubbing together. There's nothing inside of there. There we go, put it in the light a little better. So yes, they get longer and longer, but you can't tell the age of a rattlesnake by counting the rattles. That's because they sometimes break off. Now the whole process can actually take uh, a month or excuse me, a couple of weeks, but really it's only a couple of hours or less to just actually get the skin off. You saw Juniper just sliding right out of his skin. So you can't count the rattles, but this next picture is Grandpa the Rattlesnake. He's a friend of mine. If you see a rattle that long and that gorgeous, you know that's a snake that's been around for a few years and has been shedding and producing rattles. <laughs> this is an incredible process. You know, they can, um, they can rattle it something like 50 to 100 times per second, and they don't ever get tired either. So, um, you know, they can do it for hours and hours and hours. So I wanna thank you for joining me and I hope you have some questions about the skin that we all have, but of course the, the reptiles have um, scales for their keratin, whereas we have hair and the amphibians have slime and mucus glands where we have sweat. Not so different, is it? <laughs> all right, I'd be glad to take some questions now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Leslie. We learned so much about all the different adaptations favorite animals have. Love learning about this. So we had a lot of student questions. Um, I'm going to start with some of our amphibian related questions because you started with our frogs and toads. Yeah. Um, Nicole was wondering, why are the frogs different colors? There we go. Hopefully you can still see them again. Um, so oh, oh, of these specific tree frogs, yes. What's really cool is they can actually change their color based on their environment and their mood. If they are a little bit nervous, they're gonna blend into the environment around them just a little bit better. Isn't that cool? Even though they're the same species, they're just variation within a species, but also they can change when they're nervous. 
That's so cool. Um, Brian was curious, you were talking about kind of the slimy outer layer of some of these guys. How long does the slime last for? Do you have an idea about that? Well, they're, they're constantly refreshing it and, and uh, spreading it around themselves and secreting it. Almost think of it like your saliva. It's constantly forming. So it's not just like a bag that then wears out. Um, but so it depends on how hot it is, how dry it is. You know, they're going to have thicker slime when they're, you know, dried out and thinner slime when they have enough water around. Awesome. Um, Mathis and Haley were curious, how long can an amphibian live out of the water? Oh, so their name means dual life, okay? And that means they start out life in the water and then they emerge and live their life out of the water sometimes. They can spend a lot of time out of the water. Guys like this and guys like this, even not all of them actually, you can find them up in the hills and grass around the areas of water, almost as much as you find them in the water. So for quite a long time. Yeah, they, it depend, again, it depends on, do they find a moist enough hole? <laughs> do they, are they doing the right body posture? All that stuff, how hot is it outside? Makes a difference. Lots of factors. I loved that picture of all the froglets and the coyote paw print. Oh, it's so, so cool. cool. <laughs> um, Amelie was curious, why do we have hair on our bodies and frogs or amphibians don't? Yeah, so, you know, I think it's important for them to have the smooth, slimy skin because they drink through their skin and they breathe through their skin. You know, hair, I've done shows about this, hair has a lot of different purposes. And a lot of times it's keeping in the temperature or letting it cool off. Well, the amphibians, they don't need it in that way. They have their slime and their body posture to keep in that warmth. And they can kind of take it a little bit colder too than we can. Very cool. Um, okay, a couple questions about our, our snakes that you were hearing about. Uh, Kimberly was curious, how many times do snakes shed? And maybe this is in their lifetime or on average, how many times do they shed? Yeah, this is cool. So every snake is gonna be a little bit different. So, so um, Juniper actually shed the least of any of our snakes. And probably because there's that whole process of pushing out the rattle, that takes a lot of energy. So he only sheds a couple times a year. Most of our other snakes though shed about once a month, which is as much as we shed. Our entire layer sheds about once a month. And um, a, you know, younger snakes shed more often because they're growing and the skin wears out. So they might shed you know, a little bit faster. So everyone's just a little bit different, but roughly once a month is a good answer. Very cool. Isaac is wondering, does it hurt them when they shed? Oh, I bet it feels good. <laughs> you know, doesn't it feel good for you to itch and scratch and get off the old skin or when you're in the shower scrubbing? I think it feels good. And to them, it seems like when they are fresh and out of their new skin, they just seem a lot more relaxed. So. I don't know for sure. I don't think it hurts by any stretch, but I bet it actually feels good. Nice little refresh. <laughs> yeah. Um, Elena was curious about kind of, again, thinking about the keratin in our hair and our nails. Um, how come our hair feels so much smoother than our fingernails or the scales on a snake, even though it's made out of a similar um, process or similar uh, yeah, well, it can take a lot of different forms, even from individual to individual, right? I've got curly keratin. Some people have straight keratin. And, you know, the hair on your body has different purposes, too. So, you know, mostly, again, to keep in the temperature. But sometimes it's there to keep things out of your eyes. Uh, sometimes it's there to help you cool off, actually, and to prevent friction. So there's a lot of different reasons for it. So when you have keratin like his, that's not really about temperature, it's more about protection. That's why his needs to be a little bit thicker. Same for our fingernails. This is for scratching and digging and that kind of thing, right? You can't do that with your hair very well. So it's got different purposes, so therefore different textures. Got it, very interesting. Um, okay, let's see. 
Allison is curious, how do they get out of their skin? What is that process of kind of wiggling out and shedding their skin look like? Yeah, let me get this back again. So for the snake in particular, what they'll do is they'll start by rubbing their nose on a rock or a stick. So I always make sure they have natural materials in their habitat. And then what it does is it literally rolls inside out. When you saw that little video of Juniper, that was just the very last piece, almost like you're rolling off a sock. It rolls off inside out. So this is an inside out shed. This is the uh, uh, there we go, inside of his face, and there's where the outside would have been. It's a little shinier. Sorry, I'm not getting a lot of good focus today. There we go. So yeah, so that's how it's a perfect copy of him. Now, a lot of times, you know, reptiles or amphibians, especially amphibians, <laughs> actually eat their shed. <laughs> you know, it's kind of weird, but hey, how about that for cleaning up after yourself, right? So... <laughs> So that it doesn't, you know, always sit in one perfect piece. They might rip it or tear it as it comes off. Very cool. I see Juniper is also like kind of nosing around, looking around at us. Is Juniper in their habitat that they're normally in right now? No. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think I heard the question and it's something that I forgot to say. None of these animals live in these small habitats that I'm showing you in. This is just to show them for you to you for a few minutes. They're going to go back to their gigantic palaces to explore and play. You can kind of see Juniper's habitat behind me there and another snake over here to my side. Uh, and the amphibians have great big habitats in the nature lab and behind the scenes. Awesome. Um, okay, we maybe have time for one more question. And I want to remind our students, we got so many good questions. So if you have more questions about snakes or about some of the amphibians we showed today, please feel free to write them down before our program ends so you remember to look it up later. Um, let's see, ABL was wondering, do other snakes have different alarm systems? You were talking about the rattle. Is there other ways that snakes show that they're kind of on their alarm system? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. Um, the over my shoulder here, I think you can see a bow. Yeah, the gopher snake crawling along. When they get upset, they also rattle their tails, but they don't have a rattle. What they have are the leaves and sticks around them, and it makes a little buzzing sound. I think it's pretty different from the rattle. Rattlesnake's rattle is very loud, um, and there's other ways to let you know you're scared too. Um, they can puff themselves up really big. They make a hissing sound, which you know, they don't hiss all the time. They only hiss when they're nervous or sometimes when they're taking a deep breath. I heard him do that in his sleep one time. He went, <sighs> he rattled his tail a little bit in his dream. Was he dreaming? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if snakes dream. Good to know that snake body language though. It's helpful for us to understand a little bit more about what they might be thinking. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Leslie, and thank you to Juniper and all of our lovely frogs and toads that joined as well. Nice to see you guys. Thanks for your time. All right. I'm going to go ahead and close out our program today. Thanks so much for joining us. We had so much fun learning about some of the cool ways that um, amphibians and snakes um, talking about just using their slime with amphibians and maybe how snakes aren't quite so slimy, but use their scales in really cool ways. If you want to uh, look up more information about our live animal program, you can follow them on Instagram um, at NHMLA underscore live animals. You can also check out the recording of this video and others on our YouTube channel. If you go to NHMLA's YouTube channel at youtube.com slash NHMLA. Thanks so much. We'll do another slime themed program next Thursday. We hope to see you again soon. Bye everyone.